My name is Andrew Kirkendall. I'm an associate member in the Department of Malignant Hematology at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. My practice is, is somewhat unique in the sense that I, I really focus on caring for and doing clinical research within the field of, of myeloproliferative neoplasm. So most of the patients I'm seeing have polycythemia vera, myelofibrosis, essential thrombocythemia, some systemic mastocytosis, but that's where my focus lies. So polycythemia vera is, is a myeloproliferative neoplasm or, or a chronic leukemia. It's driven by activating mutations in a protein called JAK2 that leads to uh, overproduction uh, of blood cells, including red blood cells, which is really kind of the, the hallmark of, of the disease. This is typically a disease diagnosed kind of later in life, maybe in the 50s and 60s, but we certainly have some younger patients that are diagnosed as well. Typically, prognosis that goes with polycythemia vera is somewhere in the realm of 15 to 20 years. However, this can really be abbreviated by the development of cardiovascular events or thrombotic events that these patients are at higher risk for. Additionally, patients often uh, can have some degree of symptomatology with this disease. This can range from constitutional symptoms such as fevers or chills or night sweats or itching or bone pain. Itching is a unique one, actually. It can occur and get worse with, with hot showers. We call that aquagenic pruritus, and that's a bit of a unique one. But really, I think the symptom that, that is most pervasive within this field is actually this this fatigue which is very very difficult to kind of explain to put your finger on but it's something that really affects patients especially when they're living with this disease for a long time it's tough to come in and talk about how they you know just can't tend to function the way they used to they can't kind of participate in the same activities they're requiring more naps and I think that can be very frustrating for patients especially with dealing with it in the long term So historically, the treatment paradigm for polycythemia vera has been to reduce the risk uh, of thrombosis or cardiovascular events. And, and we do that through a number of different mechanisms. Uh, we, we put patients often on antiplatelet therapy with a baby aspirin. Perhaps they're maybe on other thrombotic, antithrombotic therapy as well for other reasons. We'll sometimes in a subset of patients put patients on medication, what we call cytoreductive medications. This includes hydroxyurea or interferon formulations or potentially ruxolitinib, which is a jack inhibitor that can be used in the second line but the really the one of the primary ways in which we reduce thrombotic risk is achieving and maintaining a hematocrit less than 45 percent uh, kind of so-called making the blood less thick this has been actually a, a target that's been associated with about fourfold decreased risk of major cardiovascular events and and the primary way in which we accomplish this is actually through providing somewhat something that seems somewhat archaic but it's it's therapeutic phlebotomy so we kind of just are taking you know 500 cc's or so from patients on a repeated fashion in an effort to kind of you know offset that overproduction of blood cells and maintain their hematocrit or, or their the thickness of their blood at a lower level to avoid some of these cardiovascular events. It's a bit of an interesting story. This is different than what we think about with other kind of you know cancer leukemia chronic leukemia therapies. So it, it kind of takes into account the leveraging and understanding how we regulate iron in the body. And so typically when we're iron deficient, you know, without without polycythemia vera, in patients that are iron deficient, we often associate that with anemia, so not having enough red blood cells. And in that setting, um, hepcidin is actually quite critical. So hepcidin is a master regulator of iron homeostasis. And so in the setting of iron deficiency, hepcidin levels are low and iron freely flows from kind of the intestinal absorption into the bloodstream, kind of sent down to the bone marrow to make red blood cells. Interestingly, in polycythemia vera, you have an overproduction of red blood cells in conjunction with systemic iron deficiency. So any iron that is absorbed is kind of rapidly sent to the bone marrow for more red blood cell production. And this occurs kind of at the expense of other iron requiring tissues. And so it's kind of tilted the balance to kind of hog all this iron and overproduce blood cells. And so the idea of rusfertide, which is a hepcidin mimetic, is to stimulate a high higher hepcidin state. And in doing so, it actually withholds iron distribution to the bone marrow and kind of reorients that balance uh, to, to level things out. But it restricts the overproduction of blood cells through restricting iron availability to the bone marrow, thereby kind of controlling hematocrit at a safe and steady level at our target levels without the need for these recurrent phlebotomies. So the verified trial is a phase three double blind placebo controlled trial where we took patients that have polycythemia vera, 
who were requiring frequent phlebotomies, and they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either go on rusfertide versus placebo in addition to continuing their current standard of care. So if they were on hydroxyurea, they were on interferon, they were on ruxolitinib, they stayed on that, right? And rusfertide or placebo was added to that. For the first 20 weeks of the study, the dose of rusfertide or placebo was titrated up based upon uh, hematocrit values. And then the primary endpoint of the study was really assessed from weeks 20 to 32. And the primary endpoint was the uh, was, was the absence of phlebotomy eligibility. So not needing a phlebotomy during that period of time or not meeting criteria to need phlebotomy during that period of time. That was the part 1A of the study. And that's the, really the results that we presented at ASCO this year. Patients who complete part 1A actually roll over to part 1B, which is open label respiratide. So those patients who actually were on placebo will then go on to, uh, to study drug for weeks 32 to 52. And then after week 52, everyone continues with part two of the study, which is kind of the open label long-term safety assessment period. The results of the trial that we presented in the plenary session at ASCO really focused on the, the Part 1A primary results at, at the end of week 32. And we presented the primary efficacy result, which was the absence of phlebotomy eligibility. And there we saw that respiratide was associated with you know, over twice as many patients achieving a, a response or the absence of phlebotomy eligibility compared to placebo. Over 70% of patients uh, did not meet the criteria to, to need a phlebotomy. Uh, at week 32 compared to just over 30% with placebo. Interestingly, we also presented these key secondary endpoints of which there were four. The key secondary endpoints were measured over week zero to 32. And in some way, these are, these are quite, meant, uh, quite relevant for how we practice clinically. And so one of those was just the mean number of phlebotomies patients received from week to zero to 32. Rusfertide decreased that by threefold. So just uh, 0.5 phlebotomies on average from week zero to 32 compared to 1.8 in the placebo group. Uh, we also looked at the proportion of patients who were able to maintain a hematocrit uh, less than 45% from week zero to 32. Again, seen much more commonly over 60% of the time in the Rusfertide group due uh, compared to around 14% in the placebo group. And I think really two critical key secondary endpoints looked at patient reported outcomes. So again, this is a, an agent that given its mechanism of action acting on the iron regulation pathway, we were interested and hopeful that this could potentially target some of those vague symptoms that may be associated with systemic iron deficiency, things like fatigue, decreased concentration, uh, inability to function that well. So we looked at t two key patient reported outcome measures. One was called the Promise Fatigue Score. This really focuses on fatigue and the, the role that fatigue pay, plays in patients' lives. And patients who were treated with respiratide had a more significant improvement in their fatigue from baseline to week 32 than those that were treated with placebo. Additionally, we looked at the myelofibrosis symptom assessment form, uh, total symptom score, the TSS-7. This looks at symptoms such as fatigue, uh, night sweats, uh, bone pain, uh, abdominal symptoms, uh, and again, here we saw that patients treated with respiratide had a greater improvement in their total symptom score from baseline to week 32 compared with placebo. So critical patient reported outcome measures also moving in the right direction, suggesting that this is an agent that can control hematocrit and thereby contribute to thrombotic risk reduction, but also can, can associate with improved quality of life in patients. So I think the take-home message here is that Rusfertide is an agent that can safely control hematocrit at goal levels, thereby contributing to thrombotic risk reduction and improve patients' quality of life or symptoms. This is something that I think can really quickly be added to the current standard of care in polycythemia vera. And importantly, I think it's something that we saw it, it, this is a relevant clinical trial for pa polycythemia vera patients at large because it didn't matter what cytoreductive therapy you were on. It didn't matter, you know, how long you'd had the disease. You know, this is something that all subgroups we looked at really tended to respond quite equally. So really something that we think can add to the current standard of care. When we think about this pathway, I think one of the really intriguing things about Rusfertide is it's really identified that targeting this hepcidin pathway is clinically clinically meaningful. There's a lot of different uh, other agents in production. And even looking at, at this pathway, I think it's something that we're looking at in myelofibrosis, kind of doing the inverse, right? Lowering hepcidin levels to free up iron availability for red blood cell production. And so uh, I anticipate there'll be a lot of interest and activity in this pathway moving forward and something that we think can hopefully contribute to meaningful improvements in, in quality of life and, and disease experience for our patients.